Book nine of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume two, Part one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume two, Part one, by Francois René de Chateaubriand. Translated by Alexander Texera de Matos. Book nine. Aliqua, audiere nunquam tua facta eloquentem, nunquam ego te vita freta amabilio, aspiciam post hac, at certe semper amabo. I have just taken leave of a friend. I am about to take leave of a mother. One has constantly to repeat the verses which Catullus addressed to his brother. In our vale of tears, as in hell, there is a strange eternal wailing, which forms the accompaniment or the prevailing note of human lamentations. It is heard unceasingly and it would continue when all other created sorrows had come to be silent. A letter from Julie, which I received soon after that from Fontaine, confirmed my sad remark on my gradual isolation. Fontaine urged me to work to become illustrious. My sister begged me to give up writing. One put glory before me, the other oblivion. This train of thought is described in the story of Madame de Farcy. She had grown to hate literature, because she regarded it as one of the temptations of her life. Saint Servin, first July, seventeen ninety eight. Dear, we have just lost the best of mothers. I grieve to inform you of this fatal blow. When you cease to be the object of our solicitude, we shall have ceased to live. If you knew how many tears your errors had caused our venerable mother to shed, how deplorable they appear to all who think and profess not only piety but reason, if you knew this, perhaps it would help to open your eyes to induce you to give up writing and if heaven moved by our prayers permitted us to meet again you would find in the midst of us all the happiness one is allowed on earth you would give us that happiness for there is none for us so long as you are not with us and we have cause to be anxious as to your fate ah why did i not follow my sister's advice why did i continue to write had my age remained without my writings would anything have been changed in the events and spirit of that age and so i had lost my mother and so i had distressed the last hour of her life while she was drawing her last breath far from her last son and praying for him what was i doing in london perhaps i was strolling in the cool morning air at the moment when the sweat of death covered my mother's forehead without having my hand to wipe it away the filial affection which i preserved for madame de chateaubriand was deep my childhood and youth were intimately linked with the memory of my mother the idea that i had poisoned the old days of the woman who bore me in her womb filled me with despair I flung copies of the essay into the fire with horror, as the instrument of my crime. Had it been possible for me to destroy the whole work, I should have done so without hesitation. I did not recover from my distress until the thought occurred to me of expiating my first work by means of a religious work. This was the origin of the Génie du Christianisme. My mother, I said, in the first preface to that work, after being flung at the age of seventy-two years into dungeons where she saw part of her children die expired at last on a pallet to which her misfortunes had reduced her the recollection of my errors cast a great bitterness over her last days when dying she charged one of my sisters to call me back to the religion in which i was brought up my sister acquainted me with my mother's last wish when the letter reached me across the sea my sister herself was no more she too had died from the effects of her imprisonment those two voices from the tomb that death which acted as death's interpreter impressed me i became a christian i did not yield i admit to great supernatural enlightenment my conviction came from the heart i wept and i believed i exaggerated my fault the essay was not an impious book but a book of doubt of sorrow through the darkness of that book glides a ray of the christian light that shone upon my cradle it needed no great effort to return from the scepticism of the essay to the certainty of the genie du christianisme when after receiving the sad news of madame de chateaubriand's death i resolved suddenly to change my course the title of genie du christianisme which i found on the spot inspired me i set to work i toiled with the ardour of a son building a mausoleum to his mother my materials were since long collected and rough-hewn by my previous studies i knew the works of the fathers better than they are known in our times i had even studied them in order to oppugn them and having entered upon that road with bad intentions instead of leaving it as a victor i left it vanquished as to history properly so called i had occupied myself with it specially in composing the essai sur les révolutions the camden originals which i had lately examined had made me familiar with the manners and institutions of the middle ages lastly my terrible manuscript of the natchez in two thousand three hundred and ninety three pages folio contained all that i needed for the genie du christianisme in the way of descriptions of nature 
i was able to draw largely upon that source as i had done for the essay i wrote the first part of the genie du christianisme messrs dulot who had become the booksellers of the french emigrant clergy undertook the publication the first sheets of the first volume were printed the work thus begun in london in seventeen ninety nine was completed only in paris in eighteen o two see the different prefaces to the genie du christianisme i was devoured by a sort of fever during the whole time of writing no one will ever know what it means to carry at the same time in one's brain in one's blood and in one's soul atala and rene and to combine with the painful childbirth of those fiery twins the labour of conception attending the other parts of the genie du christianisme the memory of charlotte penetrated and warmed all that and to give me the finishing stroke the first longing for fame inflamed my exalted imagination this longing came to me from filial affection i wanted a great renown so that it might rise till it reached my mother's dwelling-place and that the angels might carry her my solemn expiation as one study leads to another i could not occupy myself with my french scholia without taking note of the literature and men of the country in which i lived i was drawn into these fresh researches my days and nights were spent in reading in writing in taking lessons in hebrew from a learned priest the abbe capelin in consulting libraries and men of attainments in roaming about the fields with my everlasting reveries in paying and receiving visits if such things exist as retroactive and symptomatic effects of future events i might have foreseen the bustle and uproar created by the book which was to make my name from the seething of my mind and the throbbing of my inner muse reading aloud to others my first rough draughts helped to enlighten me reading aloud is an excellent form of instruction when one does not take the necessary compliments for gospel provided an author be in earnest he will soon feel through the impression which he instinctively receives from the others which are the weak places in his work and especially whether that work is too long or too short whether he keeps does not reach or exceeds the right dimensions i have discovered a letter from the chevalier de panat on the readings from a work at that time so unknown the letter is charming the dirty chevalier's positive and scoffing spirit did not seem susceptible of thus rubbing itself with poetry i have no hesitation in giving this letter a document of my history although it is stained from end to end with my praises as though the sly author had taken pleasure in emptying his ink-pot over his epistle monday heavens what an interesting reading i owe to your extreme kindness this morning our religion had numbered among its defenders great geniuses illustrious fathers of the church those athletes had wielded with vigour all the arms of reasoning incredulity was vanquished but that was not enough it was still necessary to show all the charms of that admirable religion it was necessary to show how suited it is to the human heart and what magnificent pictures it offers to the imagination it is no longer a theologian in the school it is the great painter and the man sensitive to impressions who open up a new horizon for themselves your work was wanted and you were called upon to write it nature has eminently endowed you with the great qualities which this work requires you belong to another age ah if the truths of sentiment rank first in the order of nature none will have proved better than yourself those of our religion you will have confounded the unbelievers at the gate of the temple and introduced delicate minds and sensible hearts into the sanctuaries you bring back to me those ancient philosophers who gave their lessons with their heads crowned with flowers their hands filled with sweet perfumes this is a very feeble image of your suave pure and classic mind i congratulate myself daily on the happy circumstance which made me acquainted with you i can never forget that it was fontaine who did me that kindness i shall love him for it the more and my heart will never separate two names whom the same glory is bound to unite if providence reopens to us the doors of our native land chevalier de panat the abbe de lille also heard some fragments of the genie du christianisme read he seemed surprised and did me the honour soon after to put into verse the prose which had pleased him he naturalised my wild american flowers in his various french gardens and put my somewhat hot wine to cool in the frigid water from his clear spring the unfinished edition of the genie du christianisme commenced in london was a little different in the order of the contents from the edition published in france the consular censure which soon became imperial showed itself very touchy on the subject of kings their persons their honour and their virtue were dear to it beforehand already fouche's police saw the white pigeon the symbol of bonaparte's candour and revolutionary innocence descend from heaven with the sacred file the true believers who had taken part in the republican processions of lyons compelled me to cut out a chapter entitled the roi Ete, and to distribute paragraphs from it here and there in the body of the work before continuing these literary investigations i must interrupt them for a moment to take leave of my uncle de bede alas that means taking leave of the first joy of my life freno non remorante dies see the old sepulchres in the old crypts 
themselves overcome by age decrepit and without memory having lost their epitaphs they have forgotten the very names of those whose ashes they contain i had written to my uncle on the subject of my mother's death he replied with a long letter containing some touching words of regret but three-quarters of his double folio sheet were devoted to my genealogy he begged me above all when i should return to france to look up the title deeds of the bedet quartering entrusted to my brother and so to this venerable emigrant exile ruin the destruction of his kin the sacrifice of louis the sixteenth alike failed to make the fact of the revolution clear to him nothing had happened nothing come to pass he had gone no further than the states of brittany and the assembly of the nobles this fixity of ideas in man is very striking in the midst and as it were in presence of the alteration of his body the flight of his years the loss of his relations and friends on his return from the emigration my uncle de bedet went to live at dinan where he died six leagues from montchois without having seen it again my cousin caroline the oldest of my three cousins still lives she has remained an old maid in spite of the formal request for her hand made in her former youth she writes me letters badly spelt in which she addresses me in the second person singular calls me chevalier and talks to me of our good time in illo tempore she was endowed with a pair of fine dark eyes and a comely figure she danced like the camargo and she seems to recollect that i bore a fierce passion for her in secret i reply in the same tone laying aside in imitation of her my years my honours and my reputation yes dear caroline your chevalier etc it must be some six or seven lustres since we met heaven be praised for it for god alone knows if we came to embracing what kind of figure we should cut in each other's eyes sweet patriarchal innocent creditable family friendship your age is past we no longer cling to the soil by a multitude of blossoms sprouts and roots we are born and die singly nowadays the living are in haste to fling the deceased to eternity and to be rid of his corpse of his friends some go and await the coffin at the church grumbling the while at being put out and disturbed in their habits others carry their devotion so far as to follow the funeral to the cemetery the grave once filled up all recollection is obliterated you will never return o oh days of religion and affection in which the son died in the same house in the same armchair by the same fireside where died his father and his grandfather before him surrounded as they had been by weeping children and grandchildren upon whom fell the last paternal blessing farewell my beloved uncle farewell family of my mother which are disappearing like the other portion of my family farewell my cousin of days long past who loved me still as you loved me when we listened together to our kind aunt de boitel's ballad of the sparrow-hawk or when you assisted at my release from my nurse's vow at the abbey of nazareth if you survive me accept the share of gratitude and affection which i here bequeath to you attach no belief to the false smile outlined on my lips in speaking of you my eyes i assure you are full of tears my studies correlative to the genie du christianisme had gradually as i have said led me to make a more thorough examination of english literature when i took refuge in england in seventeen ninety three it became necessary for me to redress most of the judgments which i had drawn from the criticisms as regards the historians hume was reputed a tory and reactionary writer he was accused as was gibbon of overloading the english language with gallicisms people preferred his continuer smollett gibbon a philosopher during his lifetime became a christian on his deathbed and in that capacity was duly convicted of being a sorry individual robertson was still spoken of because he was dry where the poets were concerned the elegant extract served as a place of banishment for a few pieces by dryden people refused to forgive pope for his verse although they visited his house at twickenham and cut chips from the weeping willow planted by him and withered like his fame blair was looked upon as a tedious critic with a french style he was placed far below johnson as to the old spectator it was relegated to the lumber-room english political works have little interest for us the economic treatises are less stinted in their scope their calculations on the wealth of nations the employment of capital the balance of trade are applicable in part to the different european societies burke emerged from the national political individuality by declaring himself opposed to the french revolution he dragged his country into the long road of hostilities which ended in the plains of waterloo however great figures remained one met with milton and shakespeare on every hand did montmorency byron sully by turns french ambassadors to the courts of elizabeth and james i ever hear speak of a merry andrew who acted in his own and other writers farces did they ever pronounce the name so outlandish in french of shakespeare did they suspect that there was here a glory before which their honours pomps and ranks would become as nothing well the comedian who undertook the part of the ghost in hamlet was the great spectre the shade of the middle ages which rose over the world like the evening star at the moment when the middle ages were at last descending among the dead giant centuries which dante opened and shakespeare closed
in the memorials of whitelock the contemporary of the singer of paradise lost we read of one mr milton a blind man parliamentary secretary for latin dispatches moliere the stage player performed his porsoniac in the same manner that shakespeare the buffoon clowned his falstaff those veiled travellers who come from time to time to sit at our board are treated by us as ordinary guests we remain unaware of their nature until the day of their disappearance on leaving the earth they become transfigured and say to us as the angel from heaven said to tobias i am one of the seven who stand before the lord but though misunderstood by men on their passage those divinities do not fail to recognise one another milton asks what needs my shakespeare for his honoured bones the labour of an age in piled stones michelangelo envying dante's lot and genius exclaims fufusio tal per las bracilios suo con sua virtute daci del mondo più felice stato tasso celebrates camoens as yet almost unknown and acts as his fame is there anything more admirable than the society of illustrious people revealing themselves one to the other by means of signs greeting one another and communing with each other in a language understood by themselves alone was shakespeare lame like lord byron sir walter scott and the prayers the daughters of jupiter if he was so in fact the boy of stratford far from being ashamed of his infirmity as was child harold is not afraid to remind one of his mistresses of it so i made lame by fortune's dearest spite shakespeare must have had many loves if we were to count one for each sonnet the creator of desdemona and juliet grew old without ceasing to be in love was the unknown woman to whom he addresses his charming verses proud and happy to be the object of shakespeare's sonnets it may be doubted glory is to an old man what diamonds are to an old woman they adorn but cannot make her beautiful says the english tragic poet to his mistress no longer mourn for me when i am dead nay if you read this line remember not the hand that writ it for i love you so that i in your sweet thoughts would be forgot if thinking on me then should make you woe oh if i say you look upon this verse when i perhaps compound a down with clay do not so much as my poor name rehearse but let your love even with my life decay shakespeare loved but believed no more in love than he believed in other things a woman to him was a bird a zephyr a flower a thing that charms and passes through his indifference to or ignorance of his fame through his condition which set him without the pale of society and of a position to which he could not hope to attain he seemed to have taken life as a light unoccupied hour a swift and gentle leisure shakespeare in his youth met old monks driven from their cloister who had seen henry the eighth his reforms his destructions of monasteries his fools his wives his mistresses his headsmen when the poet departed from life charles i was sixteen years of age thus with one hand shakespeare was able to touch the whitened heads once threatened by the sword of the second of the tudors and with the other the brown head of the second of the stuarts destined to be laid low by the axe of the parliamentarians leaning upon those tragic brows the great tragedian sank into the tomb he filled the interval of the days in which he lived with his ghosts his blind kings his ambitious men punished his unfortunate women so as to join together through analogous fictions the realities of the past and of the future shakespeare is of the number of the five or six writers who have sufficed for the needs and nutriment of thought those parent geniuses seem to have brought forth and suckled all the others homer impregnated antiquity aeschylus sophocles euripides aristophanes horace virgil are his sons dante engendered modern italy from petrarch to tasso rabelais created french literature montaigne la fontaine moliere descend from him england is all shakespeare and in these later days he has lent his language to byron his dialogue to walter scott men often disown these supreme masters they rebel against them they reckon up their faults they accuse them of tediousness of length of extravagance of bad taste what time they plunder them and deck themselves in their spoils but they struggle in vain against their yoke everything wears their colours they have left their traces everywhere they invent words and names which go to swell the general vocabulary of the nations their expressions become proverbs their fictitious characters change into real characters with heirs and a lineage they open out horizons whence burst forth sheaves of light they sow ideas the germs of a thousand others they supply all the arts with imaginations subjects styles their works are the minds or the bowels of the human mind these geniuses occupy the first rank their vastness their variety their fruitfulness their originality cause them to be accepted from the very first as laws models moles types of the various forms of intellect even as there are four or five races of men issuing from one single stock of which the others are only branches let us take care how we insult the disorders into which these mighty beings sometimes fall let us not imitate ham the accursed let us not laugh if we see the sole and solitary mariner of the deep lying naked and asleep in the shadow of the ark resting upon the mountains of armenia 
let us respect that diluvial navigator who recommenced the creation after the floodgates of heaven were shut up let us as pious children blessed by our father modestly cover him with our cloak shakespeare in his lifetime never thought of living after his life what signifies to him to-day my hymn of admiration admitting every supposition reasoning from the truths or falsehoods with which the human mind is penetrated or imbued what cares shakespeare for a renown of which the sound cannot rise to where he is a christian in the midst of eternal bliss does he think of the nothingness of the world a deist freed from the shades of matter lost in the splendours of god does he cast down a look upon the grain of sand over which he passed an atheist he sleeps to sleep without breathing or awakening which we call death nothing therefore is vainer than glory beyond the tomb unless it have kept friendship alive unless it have been useful to virtue helpful to misfortune unless it be granted to us to rejoice in heaven in a consoling generous liberating idea left behind by us upon earth novels at the end of the last century had been included in the general prescription richardson slept forgotten his fellow-countrymen discovered in his style traces of the inferior society in which he had spent his life fielding maintained his success stern the purveyor of eccentricity was out of date the vicar of wakefield was still read if richardson has no style a question of which we foreigners are unable to judge he will not live because one lives only by style it is vain to rebel against this truth the best composed work adorned with lifelike portraits filled with a thousand other perfections is still born if the style be wanting style and there are a thousand kinds is not learnt it is the gift of heaven it is talent but if richardson has only been forsaken because of certain homely turns of expression insufferable to an elegant society he may revive the revolution which is being worked in lowering the aristocracy and raising the middle classes will render less apparent or cause entirely to disappear the traces of homespun habits and of an inferior language from clarissa and tom jones sprang the two principal branches of the family of modern english novels the novels of family pictures and domestic dramas and the novels of adventure and pictures of general society after richardson the manners of the west end invaded the domain of fiction the novels became filled with country houses lords and ladies scenes at the waters adventures at the races the ball the opera rainly with the never-ending chit-chat and tittle-tattle the scene was rapidly changed to italy the lovers crossed the alps amid terrible dangers and sorrows of the soul calculated to move lions the lion shed tears a jargon of good company was adopted of the thousands of novels which have flooded england since the last fifty years two have kept their places caleb williams and the monk i did not see godwin during my stay in london but i twice met lewis he was a young member of the house of commons very pleasant with the air and manners of a frenchman the works of anne radcliffe are of a class apart those of mrs barbel miss edgeworth miss burney etc have a chance of living there should says montaigne be some correction appointed by the laws against foolish and unprofitable writers as there is against vagabonds and loiterers so should both myself and a hundred others of our people be banished scribbling seemeth to be a symptom or passion of an irregular and licentious age but these different schools of sedentary novelists of novelists travelling by diligence or calash of novelists of lakes and mountains ruins and ghosts of novelists of cities and drawing-rooms have come to be lost in the new school of walter scott even as poetry has precipitated itself in the steps of lord byron the illustrious painter of scotland started his career in literature during my exile in london with his translation of goethe's berlichingen he continued to make himself known by poetry and ultimately the bent of his genius led him towards the novel he seems to me to have created a false manner the romancer set himself to write historical romances and the historian romantic histories if in reading walter scott i am sometimes obliged to skip interminable conversations the fault is doubtless mine but one of walter scott's great merits in my eyes is that he can be placed in the hands of everybody it requires greater efforts of talent to interest while keeping within the limits of decency than to please when exceeding all bounds it is less easy to rule the heart than to disturb it burke kept the politics of england in the past walter scott drove back the english to the middle ages all that they wrote manufactured built became gothic books furniture houses churches country seats but the barons of magna charta are to-day the fashionables of bond street a frivolous race camping in the ancient manor-houses while awaiting the arrival of the new generations which are preparing to drive them out at the same time that the novel was passing into the romantic stage poetry was undergoing a similar transformation cooper abandoned the french in order to revive the national school burns commenced the same revolution in scotland after them came the restorers of the ballads several of those poets of seventeen ninety two to eighteen hundred belonged to what was called the lake school 
a name which survived because the romantic poets lived on the shores of the cumberland and westmoreland lakes which they sometimes sang thomas moore campbell rogers crabb wordsworth southey hunt knowles lord holland canning croker are still living to do honour to english literature but one must be of english birth to appreciate the full merit of an intimate class of composition which appeals specially to men born on the soil none is a competent judge in living literature of other than works written in his own tongue it is in vain that you believe yourself thoroughly acquainted with a foreign idiom you lack the nurse's milk together with the first words which she teaches you at her breast and in your swaddling clothes certain accents belong to the mother country alone the english and germans have the strangest notions concerning our men of letters they worship what we despise and despise what we worship they do not understand racine nor la fontaine nor even moliere completely it is ludicrous to know who are considered our great writers in london vienna berlin st petersburg munich leipzig Göttingen, cologne to know what is read there with avidity and what not at all when an author's merit lies especially in his diction no foreigner will ever understand that merit the more intimate individual rational a talent is the more do its mysteries escape the mind which is not so to speak that talent's fellow-countryman we admire the greeks and romans on trust our admiration comes to us by tradition and the greeks and romans are not there to laugh at our barbarian judgments which of us has an idea of the harmony of the prose of demosthenes and cicero of the cadence of the verses of alcaeus and horace as they were caught by a greek or latin ear men maintain that real beauties are of all times all countries yes beauties of feeling and of thought not beauties of style style is not cosmopolitan like thought it has a native land a sky a sun of its own burns mason cooper died during my emigration before eighteen hundred and in eighteen hundred they ended the century i commenced it darwin and beattie died two years after my return from exile beattie had announced the new era of the lyre the minstrel or the progress of genius is the picture of the first effects of the muse upon a young bard who is as yet unaware of the inspiration with which he is tossed now the future poet goes and sits by the seashore during a tempest again he leaves the village sports to listen in some lonely spot to the distant sound of the pipes beattie has run through the entire series of reveries and melancholy ideas of which a hundred other poets have believed themselves the discoverers beattie proposed to continue his poem he did in fact write the second canto edwin one evening hears a grave voice ascend from the bottom of the valley it is the voice of a solitary who after tasting the illusions of the world has buried himself in that retreat there to collect his soul and to sing the marvels of the creator this hermit instructs the young minstrel and reveals to him the secret of his genius beattie was destined to shed tears the death of his son broke his paternal heart like ossian after the loss of his son oscar he hung his harp on the branches of an oak perhaps beattie's son was the young minstrel whom a father had sung and whose footsteps he no longer saw on the mountain lord byron's verses contain striking imitations of the minstrel at the time of my exile in england lord byron was living at harrow school in a village ten miles from london he was a child i was young and as unknown as he he had been brought up on the heaths of scotland by the seaside as i in the marshes of brittany by the seaside he first loved the bible and ossian as i loved them he sang the memories of his childhood in newstead abbey as i sang mine in combourg castle when i roved a young highlander o'er the dark heath and climbed thy steep summit o morven of snow to gaze on the torrent that thundered beneath or the mist of the tempest that gathered below in my wanderings in the neighbourhood of london when i was so unhappy i passed through the village of harrow a score of times without suspecting the genius it contained i have sat in the churchyard at the foot of the elm beneath which in eighteen o seven lord byron wrote these verses at the time when i was returning from palestine spot of my youth whose hoary branches sigh swept by the breeze that fans thy cloudless sky where now alone i muse who oft have trod with those i loved thy soft and verdant sod when fate shall chill at length this fevered breast and calm its cares and passions into rest here my heart might lie here might i sleep where all my hopes arose mixed with the earth o'er which my footsteps moved deplored by those in early days allied and unremembered by the world beside and i shall say hail ancient elm at whose foot the child byron indulged in the fancies of his age while i was dreaming of rene beneath thy shade the same shade beneath which later in his turn the poet came to dream of child harold byron asked of the churchyard which witnessed the first sports of his life an unknown grave a useless prayer which fame will not grant nevertheless byron is no longer what he has been i had come across him in all directions living at venice 
at the end of a few years in the same town where i had met with his name on every hand i found him everywhere eclipsed and unknown the echoes of the lido no longer repeat his name and if you ask after him of the venetians they no longer know of whom you speak lord byron is entirely dead for them they no longer hear the neighing of his horse it is the same thing in london where his memory is fading that is what we become if i have passed by harrow without knowing that the child byron was drawing breath there englishmen have passed by combourg without suspecting that a little vagabond brought up in those woods would leave any trace arthur young the traveller when passing through combourg wrote to combourg from pontorson the country has a savage aspect husbandry has not much further advanced at least in skill than among the hurons which appears incredible amidst enclosures the people are almost as wild as their country and their town of combourg one of the most brutal filthy places that can be seen mud houses no windows and a pavement so broken as to impede all passengers but ease none yet here is a chateau and inhabited who is this monsieur de chateaubriand the owner that is nerves strung for a residence amid such filth and poverty below this hideous heap of wretchedness is a fine lake surrounded by well-wooded enclosures that monsieur de chateaubriand was my father the residence which seems so hideous to the ill-humoured agriculturist is none the less a fine and stately home sombre and grave though it may be as for me a feeble ivy shoot commencing to climb at the foot of those fierce towers would mr young have noticed me he who is interested only in inspecting our harvests give me leave to add to the above pages written in england in eighteen twenty two the following written in eighteen twenty four and eighteen forty they will complete the portion relating to lord byron this portion will be more particularly perfected when the reader has perused what i shall have to say of the great poet on passing to venice there may perhaps be some interest in the future in remarking the coincidence of the two leaders of the new french and english schools having a common fund of nearly parallel ideas and destinies if not of morals one a peer of england the other a peer of france both eastern travellers not infrequently near each other yet never seeing one another only the life of the english poet has been connected with events less great than mine lord byron visited the ruins of greece after me in child harold he seems to embellish with his own pigments the descriptions in the itineraire at the commencement of my pilgrimage i gave the sieur de joinville's farewell to his castle byron bids a similar farewell to his gothic home in the martyrs eudore sets out from messenia to go to rome our voyage was long he says we saw all those promontories marked by temples or tombstones my young companions had heard speak of naught save the metamorphoses of jupiter and they understood nothing of the remains they saw before them i myself had already sat with the prophet on the ruins of devastated cities and babylon taught me to know corinth the english poet is like the french prose writer following the letter of sulpicius to cicero a coincidence so perfect is a singularly proud one for me because i anticipated the immortal singer on the shore where we gathered the same memories and celebrated the same ruins i have again the honour of being connected with lord byron in our descriptions of rome the martyrs and my lettre sur la campagne romaine possess for me the inestimable advantage of having divined the aspirations of a fine genius the early translators commentators and admirers of lord byron were careful not to point out that some pages of my works might have lingered for a moment in the memory of the painter of child harold they would have thought that they were depreciating his genius now that the enthusiasm has grown a little calmer this honour is not so consistently refused to me our immortal song-writer in the last volume of his chansons says in one of the foregoing stanzas i speak of the lyres which france owes to m de chateaubriand i do not fear that that verse will be contradicted by the new poetic school which born beneath the eagle's wings has often and rightly prided itself on that origin the influence of the author of the genie du christianisme has also made itself felt abroad and it would perhaps be just to recognise that the singer of child harold belongs to the family of rene in an excellent article on lord byron m villemain re-echoes m de Béranger's remark some incomparable pages in rene he says had it is true exhausted that poetic character i do not know whether byron imitated them or revived them with his genius what i have just said as to the affinity of imagination and destiny between the chronicles of rene and the singer of child harold does not detract in the smallest degree from the fame of the immortal bard what harm can my pedestrian and luteless muse do to the muse of the d furnished with a lyre and wings lord byron will live whether a child of his century like myself he gave utterance like myself and like goethe before us to its passion and misfortune or whether my circumnavigation and the lantern of my gallic bark showed the vessel of albion the track across unexplored waters besides 
two minds of an analogous nature may easily have similar conceptions without being reproached with slavishly following the same road it is permitted to take advantage of ideas and images expressed in a foreign language in order with them to enrich one's own that has occurred in all ages and at all times i recognize without hesitation that in my early youth ossian werther the reverie du promeneur solitaire and the etude de la nature may have allied themselves to my ideas but i have hidden or dissimulated none of the pleasure caused me by works in which i delighted if it were true that rene entered to some extent into the groundwork of the one person represented under different names in child harold conrad lara manfred the jaw if by chance lord baron had made me live in his own life would he then have had the weakness never to mention me was i then one of those fathers whom men deny when they have attained to power can lord baron have been completely ignorant of me when he quotes almost all the french authors who are his contemporaries did he never hear speak of me when the english papers like the french papers have resounded a score of times in his hearing with controversies on my works when the new times drew a parallel between the author of the genie du christianisme and the author of child harold no intelligence however favoured it be but has its susceptibilities its distrusts one wishes to keep the sceptre fears to share it resents comparisons in the same way another superior talent has avoided the mention of my name in a work on literature thank god rating myself at my just value i have never aimed at empire since i believe in nothing except the religious truth of which liberty is a form i have no more faith in myself than in any other thing here below but i have never felt a need to be silent where i have admired that is why i proclaim my enthusiasm for madame de steel and lord byron what is sweeter than admiration it is love in heaven affection raised to a cult we feel ourselves thrilled with gratitude for the divinity which extends the basis of our faculties opens out new views to our souls gives us a happiness so great and so pure with no admixture of fear or envy for the rest the little cavil which i have raised in these memoirs against the greatest poet whom england has possessed since milton proves only one thing the high value which i would have attached to the recollection of his muse lord byron started a deplorable school i presume he has been as much distressed at the child harold's to whom he gave birth as i am at the renes who rave around me the life of lord byron is the object of much investigation and calumny young men have taken magic words seriously women have felt disposed to allow themselves affrightedly to be seduced by that monster to console that solitary and unhappy satan who knows he had perhaps not found the woman he sought a woman fair enough a heart as big as his own byron according to the phantasmagorial opinion is the old serpent of seduction and corruption because he sees the corruption of the human race he is a fatal and suffering genius placed between the mysteries of matter and mind who is unable to solve the enigma of the universe who looks upon life as a frightful and causeless irony as a perverse smile of evil he is the son of despair who despises and denies who bearing an incurable wound within himself seeks his revenge by leading through voluptuousness to sorrow all who approach him he is a man who has not passed through the age of innocence who has never had the advantage of being rejected and cursed by god a man who issuing reprobate from nature's womb is the damned soul of nihility this is the byron of heated imaginations it is by no means to my mind the byron of truth two different men are united in lord byron as in the majority of men the man of nature and the man of system the poet perceiving the part which the public made him play accepted it and began to curse the world which at first he had only viewed dreamily this progress can be traced in the chronological order of his works his genius far from having the extent attributed to it is fairly reserved his poetic thought is no more than a moan a plaint an imprecation in that quality it is admirable one must not ask the lyre what it thinks but what it sings his mind is sarcastic and diversified but of an exciting nature and a baneful influence the writer had read voltaire to good purpose and imitates him gifted with every advantage lord byron had little with which to reproach his birth the very accident which made him unhappy and which allied his superiority to the infirmity of mankind ought not to have vexed him since it did not prevent him from being loved the immortal singer knew from his own case the truth of zeno's maxim the voice is the flower of beauty a deplorable thing is the rapidity with which nowadays reputations pass away at the end of a few years what am i saying of a few months the infatuation disappears and disparagement follows upon it already lord byron's glory is seen to pale his genius is better understood by ourselves he will have altars longer in france than in england since child harold excels mainly in the depicting of sentiments peculiar to the individual the english who prefer sentiments common to all 
will end by disowning the poet whose cry is so deep and so sad let them look to it if they shatter the image of the man who has brought them to life again what will they have left when during my sojourn in london in eighteen twenty two i wrote my opinion of lord byron he had no more than two years to live upon earth he died in eighteen twenty four at the moment when disenchantment and disgust were about to commence for him i preceded him in life he preceded me in death he was called before his turn my number was higher than his and yet his was drawn first charles harold should have remained the world could lose me without noticing my disappearance on continuing my road through life i met madame guccioli in rome lady byron in paris frailty and virtue thus appeared to me the former had perhaps too many realities the latter too few dreams now after having talked to you of the english writers at the period when england served me as an asylum it but remains for me to tell you of england herself at that period of her appearance her sights her country seats her private and political manners the whole of england may be seen in the space of four leagues from richmond above london down to greenwich and below below london lies industrial and commercial england with her docks her warehouses her custom-houses her arsenals her breweries her factories her foundries her ships the latter at each high tide ascend the thames in three divisions first the smallest then the middle-sized lastly the great vessels which graze with their sails the columns of the old sailors hospital and the windows of the tavern where the visitors dine above london lies agricultural and pastoral england with her meadows her flocks and herds her country houses her parks whose shrubs and lawns are bathed twice a day by the rising waters of the thames between these two opposite points richmond and greenwich london blends all the characteristics of this twofold england the aristocracy in the west end the democracy in the east the tower of london and westminster abbey are landmarks between which is laid the whole history of great britain i passed a portion of the summer of seventeen ninety nine at richmond with christian de la Mognon, occupying myself with the genie du christianisme i went on the thames in a rowing boat or walked in richmond park i could have wished that richmond by london had been the richmond of the treaty on a retimundiae for then i should have found myself in my own country and for this reason william the bastard made a grant to allen duke of brittany his son-in-law of four hundred and forty-two english feudal estates which since formed the county of richmond the dukes of brittany allen's successors and fioft these domains to breton knights cadets of the families of Rouen, tantiniac chateaubriand goyon montboucher but in spite of my inclinations i must look in yorkshire for the county of richmond raised to a duchy by charles the second in favour of a bastard the richmond on the thames is the old sheen of edward the third there in thirteen seventy seven died edward the third that famous king robbed by his mistress alice perrers who was not the same as the alice or catherine of salisbury of the early days of the life of the victor of cressy you should only love at the age when you can be loved henry the eighth and elizabeth also died at richmond where does one not die henry the eighth took pleasure in this residence the english historians are greatly embarrassed by that abominable man on the one hand they are unable to conceal the tyranny and servitude to which the parliament was subjected on the other hand if they too heartily anathematized the head of the reformation they would condemn themselves in condemning him plus l'oppresse est vil plus l'esclave est infâme in richmond park is shown the mound which served henry the eighth as an observatory from which to spy for the news of the execution of anne boleyn henry leapt for joy when the signal shot up from the tower of london what delight the steel had cut through the slender neck and covered with blood the beautiful tresses to which the poet king had fastened his fatal kisses in the deserted park at richmond i awaited no murderous signal i would not even have wished the slightest harm to any who might have betrayed me i strolled among the peaceful deer accustomed to run before a pack of hounds they stopped when they were tired they were carried back very gay and quite amused with this game in a cart filled with straw i went at kew to see the kangaroos ridiculous animals the exact opposite to the giraffe these innocent four-footed grasshoppers peopled australia better than the old duke of queensbury's prostitutes peopled the lanes of richmond the thames bathed the lawn of a cottage half hidden beneath a cedar of lebanon and amidst weeping willows a newly married couple had come to spend the honeymoon in that paradise one evening as i was strolling over the swords of twickenham peltier appeared holding his handkerchief to his mouth what an everlasting deuce of a fog he cried as soon as he was within earshot how the devil can you remain here i have made out my list stowe blenheim hampton court oxford with your dreamy ways you might live with john bull in vitam eternam and not see a thing i asked in vain to be excused i had to go in the carriage peltier enumerated his hopes to me he had relays of them no sooner had one croaked beneath him than he straddled another and on he would go a leg on either side to his journey's end one of his hopes the robustest eventually led him to bonaparte whom he took by the coat-collar napoleon had the simplicity to hit back 
Peltier took Sir James Mackintosh as his second. He was condemned by the courts, and made a new fortune, which he incontinently ran through, by selling the documents relating to his trial. Blenheim was distasteful to me. I suffered so much the more from an ancient reverse of my country, in that I had had to endure the insult of a recent affront. A boat going up the Thames caught sight of me on the bank. Seeing a Frenchman, the oarsmen gave cheers. The news had just been received of the naval battle of Aboukir. These successes of the foreigner, which might open the gates of France to me, were hateful to me. Nelson, whom I had often met in Hyde Park, wrapped his victories in Lady Hamilton's shawl at Naples, while the Lazzaroni played at ball with human heads. The Admiral died gloriously at Trafalgar, and his mistress wretchedly at Calais, after losing beauty, youth, and fortune. And I, taunted on the Thames with the victory of Aboukir, have seen the palm-trees of Libya edging the calm and deserted sea, which was ridden with the blood of my fellow-countrymen. Stowe Park is famous for its ornamental buildings. I prefer its shades. The Cicerone of the place showed us, in a gloomy ravine, the copy of a temple of which I was to admire the original in the dazzling valley of the Suffices. Beautiful pictures of the Italian school, pined in the darkness of some uninhabited rooms, whose shutters were kept closed. Poor Raphael, imprisoned in a castle of the ancient Britons, far from the skies of the Finicina. At Hampton Court was preserved the collection of portraits of the mistresses of Charles II. You see how that prince took things on emerging from a revolution which cut off his father's head, and which was to drive out his house. At Slough we saw Herschel with his learned sister and his great forty-foot telescope. He was looking for new planets. This made Peltier laugh, who kept to the seven old ones. We stopped for two days at Oxford. I took pleasure in this republic of Alfred the Great. It represented the privileged liberties and the manners of the literary institutions of the Middle Ages. We hurried through the twenty colleges, the libraries, the pictures, the museum, the botanic garden, I turned over with extreme pleasure among the manuscripts of Worcester College a life of the Black Prince, written in French verse by the Prince's Herald at Arms. Oxford, without resembling them, recalled to my memory the modest colleges of Dol, Rennes, and Dinan. I had translated Gray's elegy written in a country churchyard, the curfew tolls the knell of parting day, which is imitated from Dante's Scrilla di lontano che pagia il giorno piange che si musre. Peltier had hastened to trumpet my translation in his paper, at sight of oxford i remembered the same poets owed on a distant prospect of eton college our happy hills our pleasing shade our fields beloved in vain where once my careless childhood strayed a stranger yet to pain i feel the gales that from ye blow my weary soul they seem to soothe and redolent of joy and youth to breathe a second spring say father thames what idle progeny succeed to chase the rolling circle speed or urge the flying ball alas regardless of their doom the little victims play no sense have they of ills to come nor care beyond to-day who has not experienced the feelings and regrets here expressed with all the sweetness of the muse who has not softened at the recollection of the games the studies the loves of his early years but can they be revived the pleasures of youth reproduced by the memory are ruined seen by torchlight separated from the continent by a long war the english at the end of the last century preserved their national manners and character there was still but one people in whose name the sovereign power was wielded by an aristocratic government only two great friendly classes existed bound by a common interest the patrons and the dependents that jealous class called the bourgeoisie in france which is beginning to arise in england was then not known nothing came between the rich landowners and the men occupied with their trades everything had not yet become machinery in the manufacturing professions folly in the privileged classes along the same pavements where one now sees dirty faces and men in surtouts pass little girls in white cloaks with straw hats fastened under the chin with a ribbon a basket on their arm containing fruit or a book all kept their eyes lowered or blushed when one looked at them britain says shakespeare is in a great pool a swan's nest surtouts without coats beneath were so little worn in london in seventeen ninety three that a woman who was weeping bitterly over the death of louis the sixteenth said to me but my dear sir is it true that the poor king was dressed in a surtout when they cut off his head the gentlemen farmers had not yet sold their patrimony in order to come and live in london in the house of commons they still formed the independent fraction which acting in opposition to the ministry kept up ideas of liberty order and property they hunted the fox or shot pheasants in autumn ate fat geese at christmas shouted hurrah for roast beef grumbled at the present praised the past cursed pitt and the war which sent up the price of port and went to bed drunk to begin the same life over again next day they were firmly convinced that the glory of great britain would never fade so long as they sang god save the king maintained the rotten boroughs kept the game laws in vigour and sent hares and partridges to market by stealth 
under the name of lions and ostriches the anglican clergy was learned hospitable and generous it had received the french clergy with true christian charity the university of oxford printed at its own cost and distributed gratis among the cures a new testament according to the latin vulgate with the imprint in usum clary gallicani in anglia exulantis as to the life of the english upper classes i a poor exile saw nothing of it but the outside on the occasion of receptions at court or at the princess of wales's ladies went by seated sideways in sedan chairs their great hoop petticoats protruded through the door of the chair like altar hangings they themselves on those altars of their waists resembled madonnas or pagodas those fine ladies were the daughters whose mothers the duc de guiche and the duc de lausanne had adored those daughters are in eighteen twenty two the mothers and grandmothers of the little girls who now come to my house to dance in short frocks to the sound of colinet's clarinet swift generations of flowers the england of sixteen eighty eight was at the end of the last century at the apogee of its glory as a poor emigrant in london from seventeen ninety three to eighteen hundred i heard pitt fox sheridan wilberforce grenville whitbread lauderdale erskine as a magnificent ambassador in london to-day in eighteen twenty two i could not say how far i am impressed when instead of the great orators whom i used to admire i see those get up who were their seconds at the time of my first visit the pupils in the place of the masters general ideas have penetrated into that particular society but the enlightened aristocracy placed at the head of this country since one hundred and forty years will have shown to the world one of the finest and greatest societies that have done honour to mankind since the roman patricians perhaps some old family seated in the depths of its county will recognise the society which i have depicted and regret the time whose loss i here deplore in seventeen ninety two mr burke parted from mr fox the question at issue was the french revolution which mr burke attacked and mr fox defended never had the two orators who till then had been friends displayed such eloquence the whole house was moved and mr fox's eyes were filled with tears when mr burke concluded his speech with these words the right honourable gentleman in the speech he has just made has treated me in every sentence with uncommon harshness by declaring a censure upon my whole life conduct and opinions notwithstanding this great and serious though on my part unmerited attack i shall not be dismayed i am not yet afraid to state my sentiments in this house or anywhere else i will tell all the world that the constitution is in danger it certainly is indiscretion at any period but especially at my time of life to provoke enemies or to give my friends occasion to desert me yet if my firm and steady adherence to the british constitution places me in such a dilemma i will risk all and as public duty and public prudence teach me with my last words exclaim fly from the french constitution mr fox having said that there was no loss of friends mr burke exclaimed yes there is a loss of friends i know the price of my conduct i have done my duty at the price of my friend our friendship is at an end i warn the two right honourable gentlemen who are the great rivals in this house that whether they hereafter move in the political atmosphere as two flaming meteors or walk together like brethren hand in hand to preserve and cherish the british constitution to guard against innovation and to save it from the danger of these new theories a memorable time in the world's history mr burke whom i knew towards the close of his life crushed by the death of his only son had founded a school for the benefit of the children of the poor emigrants i went to see what he called his nursery he was amused at the vivacity of the foreign race which was growing up under his paternal genius looking at the careless little exiles hopping he said to me our boys could not do that and his eyes filled with tears he thought of his son who had set out for a longer exile pitt fox and burke are no more and the british constitution has undergone the influence of the new theories one must have witnessed the gravity of the parliamentary debates of that time one must have heard those orators whose prophetic voices seem to announce a coming revolution to form an idea of the scene which i am recalling liberty confined within the limits of order seemed to struggle at westminster under the influence of anarchical liberty which spoke from the still blood-stained rostrum of the convention mr pitt was tall and thin and wore a sad and mocking look his utterance was cold his intonation monotonous his gestures imperceptible nevertheless the lucidity and fluency of his thought the logic of his arguments suddenly lighted with flashes of eloquence raised his talent to something out of the common i used often to see mr pitt when he went from his house on foot across st james's park to wait upon the king george the third on his side arrived from windsor after drinking beer out of a pewter pot with the neighbouring farmers he drove through the ugly courtyards of his ugly palace in a dowdy carriage followed by a few horse-guards that was the master of the kings of europe as five or six city merchants are the masters of india mr pitt in a black coat a steel-hilted sword at his side his hat under his arm 
climbed the stairs taking two or three steps at a time on his way he found only three or four unemployed emigrants casting a scornful look in their direction he went on with his nose in the air and his pale face the great financier maintained no order in his own affairs had no regular hours for his meals or his sleep over head and ears in debt he paid nobody and could not bring himself to add up a bill a footman kept house for him badly dressed with no pleasures no passions greedy only for power he scorned honours and refused to be more than plain william pitt lord liverpool in the month of june last eighteen twenty two took me to dine at his country place when we were crossing putney heath he showed me the little house in which died a poor man the son of lord chatham the statesman who had taken europe into his pay and with his own hand distributed all the millions in the world george the third survived mr pitt but he had lost his reason and his sight every session at the opening of parliament the ministers read to the silent and moved houses the bulletin of the king's health one day i had gone to visit windsor a few shillings persuaded an obliging doorkeeper to hide me so that i might see the king the monarch white-haired and blind appeared wandering like king lear through his palace and groping with his hands along the walls of the apartments he sat down to a piano of which he knew the position and played some portions of a sonata by handel a fine ending for old england i began to turn my eyes towards my native land a great revolution had been operated bonaparte had become first consul and was restoring order by means of despotism many exiles were returning the upper emigration especially hastened to go and collect the remnants of its fortune loyalty was dying at the head while its heart still beat in the breasts of a few half-naked country gentlemen mrs lindsay had left she wrote to messrs de la Mognon to return she also invited madame d'agesso sister of messrs de la Mognon, to cross the channel fontaine wrote to me to finish the printing of the genie du christianisme in paris while remembering my country i felt no desire to see it again gods more powerful than the paternal lares kept me back i had neither goods nor refuge in france my motherland had become to me a bosom of stone a breast without milk i should not find my mother there nor my brother nor my sister julie lucile still lived but she had married monsieur de caux and no longer bore my name my young widow knew me only through a union of a few months through misfortune and through an absence of eight years had i been left to myself i do not know that i should have had the strength to leave but i saw my little circle dissolving madame d'agesso proposed to take me to paris i let myself go the prussian minister procured me a passport in the name of la sagne an inhabitant of neuchatel messrs dulot stopped the printing of the genie du christianisme and gave me the sheets that had been set up i separated the sketches of atala and rene from the natchez the remainder of the manuscript i locked into a trunk of which i entrusted the deposit to my host in london and i set out for dover with madame d'agesso mrs lindsay was awaiting us at calais it was thus that i quitted england in eighteen hundred my heart was differently occupied from the manner in which it is at the time of writing in eighteen twenty two i brought back from the land of exile only dreams and regrets to-day my head is filled with scenes of ambition of politics of grandeurs and courts so ill-suited to my nature how many events are heaped up in my present existence pass men pass my turn will come i have unrolled only one-third of my days before your eyes if the sufferings which i have borne have weighed upon my vernal serenity now entering upon a more fruitful age the germ of rene is about to develop and bitterness of another kind will be blended with my narrative what shall i not have to tell in speaking of my country of her revolutions of which i have already shown the foreground of the empire and of the gigantic man whom i have seen fall of the restoration in which i played so great a part that restoration glorious to-day in eighteen twenty two although nevertheless i am able to see it only through i know not what ill-omened mist i end this book which touches the spring of eighteen hundred arriving at the close of my first career i see opening before me the writer's career from a private individual i am about to become a public man i leave the virginal and silent retreat of solitude to enter the dusty and noisy crossroads of the world broad day is about to light up my dreamy life light to penetrate my kingdom of shadows i cast a melting glance upon these books which contain my unremembered hours i seem to be bidding a last farewell to the paternal house i take leave of the thoughts and illusions of my youth as of sisters of loving women whom i leave by the family hearth and whom i shall see no more we took four hours to cross from dover to calais i stole into my country under the shelter of a foreign name doubly hidden beneath the obscurity of the swiss lasagne and my own i entered france with the century End of book nine.